All right. So hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to kind of go into some different things today on generative AI and its impact uh, on teaching and learning. I will say at the beginning that I am uh, not an expert on AI. Uh, I am uh, I am an instructional technologist at the Center for Teaching. So basically what that means um, is that uh, I am kind of the nerd of the of the department. Um, so I have been tasked with trying to learn as much as I possibly can about AI in the last, uh, especially the last six months, but basically since about December, um, chat GPT came out late November. Uh, and then once that kind of got picked up and we realized what was going on with that, everything else kind of moved pretty quick on that. Um, and so I kind of want to touch on several different things, um, but I do think it is important at the beginning to kind of touch or to kind of be clear on what are our goals for today, what are we here to do, but also at the same time, what are we not here to do? So I do want to do some basics of explaining how generative AI tools like ChatGPT work. I think the more you understand about how the tools work, the easier it is to kind of figure out how that's going to fit in your courses. Because realistically, there are a ton of different AI tools out there. Some may fit in your course perfectly and be a great addition, and some may not impact you whatsoever. And so it really depends on your content area as to how well that's going to work. But understanding the basics of, of, of how these tools work is, is a good step to that. I also want to identify opportunities uh, for, for, for both how you can use these tools, both in the classroom, in uh, your course design and planning, um, as well as, let's be honest, just talking to your students about it. Um, a lot of students uh, in, in higher education, and I know at Vanderbilt, um, they know about AI. Some of them are using it. Some of them are using it a lot. Some of them are not using it. But almost all of them are kind of in a state right now of confusion, meaning they may have five or six classes this semester, and because every instructor can essentially come up with, with, with their own policy about what is allowed or not allowed in the classroom, they may have a different policy for every single course. And so trying to be clearer uh, in your communication with them so that they know what is allowed and what is expected is going to be a big help, I think. Um, also, I uh, want to touch on uh, what 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 we are not here to do. So my goal today is not to convince you that AI is awesome and the future of everything and it's going to change the world in the next five years. It may. I don't really know. I'm not, uh, to use some religious terminology, I'm not here to evangelize or demonize. It may be awesome. You may love it. You may think it's horrible. Great. Your opinions, your classes, you handle that um, how, how you think it's going to be best. Um, also, just because... Uh, of the time that we have, of one hour, uh, we do not have the time to dig real deep into the kind of larger societal and political implications. Um, I'm a giant nerd. I love AI and tech policy and stuff like that. So if you want to talk about that afterwards, great. But let's try to uh, uh, stay as focused as we can on... Um, on 
on how this impacts teaching and learning. So best way to start that I can think of is to be real clear about what do we mean when we say AI. For the purposes of this presentation, I really want to focus on one specific type of, of AI called 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 generative AI. That is a specific type in that it enables users to generate something. It produces something. It could be text. It could be an image. It could be audio. It could be video. It could be code. It could be a lot of things, but it is allowing users to create something. And so the reason I specify that is um, a lot of times, especially in the last uh, 10, 11 months, uh, a lot of people say AI as kind of a general term meaning generative AI, but other examples of AI could be uh, tools used in self-driving cars and uh, in facial re recognition software. Um, a ton of other examples all have their own pros and cons and societal impacts, but I really want to... Um, the focus today is going to be on that generative AI part. Um, and al also with that, I talked about the d different examples of what it can output. It can also input a lot of those things. So most of the tools that you may be familiar with are going to be text-based tools where you give it a prompt and it spits out some kind of text. You can do that same thing to generate images or g generate audio. And a lot of times you're typing in text. Sometimes you are you are uploading audio and then it's doing something to produce audio from that. Could be the same with images. Could be a combination of those uh, where you both give it an image and text and then it generates a new image. So there are a lot of different kind of options there uh, for what types of data can can be used with with generative AI. Um, the easiest example I can give and the the one that most people are are most familiar with is chat GPT. It is the one uh, AI and generative AI have been on the scene uh, in the tech world for years. But when ChatGPT launched uh, kind of toward the end of November last year and it was open to the public and people could see what it could do, um, that got a lot of attention and got a lot of, uh, oh, no, what what is going on? This is going to be awesome. This is going to destroy the world and everything in between. And so... Uh, I wanted to use an example there to kind of show you if if you've not used it, which I do encourage you to use it on your own, um, even if you don't plan on using it in class. I do think it's one of those things of using it and testing it out, learning a bit of, of how it works can um, sometimes take away that, oh, AI is 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 kind of like magic feeling. Uh because you figure out uh, what is it good at and what is it not good at. And different tools have different strengths and weaknesses. So this is an example prompt I put into chat GPT. Uh, for those that do not know me, uh, I have a background in, in, in agriculture. I taught high school agriculture. Uh, agricultural science for 10 years uh, before I came here to Vanderbilt. And so uh, I decided, okay, let's uh, have the have the AI tool uh, create a lesson plan on the history of agriculture in Tennessee. Should be an hour-long class. It is an introductory course, so the content sh should be appropriate for first or second year college students. This is a real easy example of the more detailed you are with your prompt, typically the better output you get. 
Um, and the output I that I got is um, is kind of what you can see here. This may be hard to read on your screen, and that's fine. I do have a full copy of this in the box folder that I'm going to share with you at the end. But a few things I want to pull out. So it created an objective. How long is the lesson? What materials do you need? And then a breakdown of procedure as far as what you should do in the class, how long it should be. So the introduction should, should be five minutes. You should have a 10 minute discussion. You should go over the, the, the historical overview, the economic impact and so on and so forth. Um, is this as good of a lesson plan as, as I could do on my own or as you as a university professor could do? No, probably not, but it's, it is something that was generated in about 10 seconds. So speed is kind of the big plus with AI. Also, this is a good example of, of pulling out certain things that I don't mention in the prompt. So I said, let's talk about historic the history of agriculture in Tennessee, it pulls out, okay, so we want to look at its impact on the state's economy, culture, and environment. I never brought those up. So why did it bring those out? Because when it looks in its training data, for examples of discussions about the history of agriculture, those are three common themes. Same as down in the pre-activity discussion, it specifically says, have you ever considered the historical significance of agriculture in our state? In our state. If I go back to, uh, to the prompt, I never said that I am a professor in Tennessee. It picked that out. Because typically, if you're talking about the history of, of agriculture in a state, it's your own state. And so that's something it picked out there. It also picked out the major ag industries in Tennessee as being crops and livestock and forestry and food processing. And those are the 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 top ag um, ag commodities in Tennessee not in that order but it's still pretty good again is this is this perfect no but it's not bad for 10 seconds okay um and so what is going on here when you, you use a tool like chat GBT? um I will say again I am not a computer scientist uh if you want a really in-depth explanation of how tools like this work the Data Science Institute here at Vanderbilt has had a ton of great workshops about AI. And back in the spring, they had one on understanding AI models uh, that is now on YouTube and is a really good resource to kind of understand um, what in in more detail what what I'm going to talk about here. So basically what happens is you have some kind of prompt. A prompt is what you put into the AI tool to get it started, okay? Whatever prompt you, you put in is then going to be encoded by the tool into some form it can use. Then that goes into two di different parts here. And sometimes these get confused. So I wanna be specific as to, as to what I'm talking about. So the language model is gonna be, um, what model are you using? That could be chat GPT, that could be GPT-4, that could be, that could be something like an image generator like Dolly, could be, uh, um, a lot of different models 
have d different approaches to how they try to generate their output. So that model looks at what it has been given. It looks at its collection of training data to give you an idea. Chat GPT is trained on, I think it's 570 gigabytes of data, um, of text. A lot of that is text from the web. So it could be from online news, uh, a lot of it's from Wikipedia. A lot of it's from older books. Uh, key thing, and I'll talk about this a bit later, is that training data is fixed. So they have that data up until a certain point. So ChatGPT, I believe, is until September of 2021. Um, so if you ask it stuff after that, it may know, it may not. Uh, it Well, it's not going to know, but it may give you an answer. It may not. So it looks at all that and says, okay, here's the information I have that applies to what they are talking about. And then here's the key thing. All of these AI tools, the text ones, the models are looking for a pattern and then, and then apply that pattern to what you are, are asking about. And then its job is, it's trained to predict the next most likely word or phrase. And so it is not looking to give you a correct answer because it has no concept of what correct is. It just says, in my training data, in cases like this, this has been the most likely type of output. And then it generates whatever that output is. So in the in the example I used before, it said, okay, uh, you want a lesson plan? Here's what I know lesson plans uh, look like and how they're structured. And then I'm going to use that pattern to to apply to what you are asking for. Um, and so what does this really mean? It means that all these tools are trained on a large amount of past uh, of past data. The, those models are called large language models, uh, specifically the technology that is used, uh, and most of them are called transformers. That is the T in chat GPT is, is transformers. Um, and so again, they are designed to predict the next most likely word or phrase. Example, if you go into chat GPT and you type in Mary had a little and that's it you just type in those four words and, and and hit enter it looks at its training data and says hey when I see those four combination of words in that order almost every time it's followed by lamb it's fleece was white as snow blah blah, blah. it's trained on a lot of on text from the internet, most of it English, most of it from kind of a Western audience, so it knows that. Again, it's looking for patterns, though. And so if you change that slightly and say Sam had a little, it goes, I don't know what you mean. Uh, looks like you've started a sentence, but it is incomplete. Uh, what are you talking about here? Okay. And so because that technology is not so difficult in that uh, it is impossible to reproduce, you have a ton of different tools that can be used that fall under the, the umbrella of generative AI. Uh, some examples of that are on the, 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 are on the screen now. Um, text examples the most common is chat gpt that is uh much as i dislike it almost at the point of being like kleenex of uh, people say chat gpt to refer to all all of ai um i can under i can understand that to a point i grew up in the south so i say coke for any kind of carbonated beverage uh even though coke is one specific tool 
ChatGPT is one specific tool. You also have Google Bard, Claude, a lot of others. You also have some of those tools combined with a web search. So you have Bing Chat, you have you have the the Google generative search experience, which is just launched a few weeks ago and is still an an opt-in feature. Both of these take those AI models and combine them with their own live search data. And so you're able to get more more recent and relevant data as part of that. You also ha have these AI tools that are being combined in a lot of different productivity software. So right now in Google Drive, if you go and opt into it, uh, you can use what they call Duet AI and have an AI tool in Google Docs, in Google Sheets, in, in Slides. Uh, and so th that part is there now. On the image ge generation front, which I personally really enjoy because I'm a horrible, horrible artist, um, you can use tools like Dolly, which is made by the same company that makes Chat GPT. Uh, Bing Chat has its own um, image tool, but Bing is owned by Microsoft. They have a partnership with OpenAI, the company that makes JetChat, GPT, and DALI. So all of those Bing tools are powered by OpenAI's tools. So th there's a strong connection there. But because it is a tool from Microsoft, they are able to put in uh, what I call guardrails of we want it to be more focused example easy easy example if you go into chat gpt and say write me a five paragraph essay on this topic it'll just do it if you go into bing chat and do that same thing uh it'll say something to the effect of well i can't write the paper for you but here's an outline of topics you could cover that is a choice they that that bing has made to avoid a use case that they don't like, okay? Um, you can also use AI for a lot of other things to create video, audio, uh, to improve captions. Uh, you can use it to, to pull uh, transcripts from video and audio. Um, I did this workshop last week uh, and had somebody ask about some free tools for those uh for those transcription examples the problem with transcriptions and we'll talk about the free versus paid options in a minute um transcriptions are historically something that a lot of people have been willing to pay for so the ai tools now are building on that so a lot of them are paid as well um just how does how does it work? I've shown an example already, but easiest way that I can do this is to uh, pull up chat GPT and show you an example. So uh, just to make sure, I believe everybody should be seeing the chat GPT screen now. I'm getting some thumbs up. Great. Okay. I was practicing with this before. So if it doesn't work, please tell me. So here's an example prompt that I have. Uh, I am telling the the AI, you are an expert historian who specializes in the history of education in America. Please generate five historical examples when technology has disrupted education. For each example, include uh, an explanation of when this occurred and how education was disrupted. Um, if you have seen or heard anything about Jules White's prompt engineering course, uh, it is through Coursera. It is free for anybody at Vanderbilt. I strongly encourage you to take that. Some of his practices he uses and he recommends there are kind of in play here as far as giving the chat a tool a persona. So it know it is a little bit it can be a bit more focused. 
So I put that in, it immediately starts to, ge to generate text. Uh, so it starts with the printing press, makes sense. The chalkboard, okay, sure. The radio, I'll be honest, I was testing this yesterday. The radio would not have occurred to me at all, but seeing this come up s several times, I was like, okay, sure, yeah. Uh, and then TV, having educational TV is a thing that we kind of take for granted. Uh, and th then, of course, the internet. You're like, okay, that's a pretty good list, but I want some more. Uh, please uh, list five more. So I just said, okay, give me five more. Note, I did not say what I wanted more of, but it has the ability to remember context. So it's able to say, all right, he wants five more, five more of what? Here's what I just made. Here's what he just prompted me. Okay, I'm going to give five more in that same format using those same instructions he already gave. And so that's a big plus with AI tools that a lot of people don't, don't I think, don't always keep in mind is that it shouldn't be, if you're trying to get a lot out of it, it shouldn't be a one-time thing. Have a conversation back and forth. That is something that I think can get you a lot better output from that. Okay. Um, now I'm going to jump back over to PowerPoint. You should now be seeing PowerPoint. Please give me a thumbs up if you are. Okay, cool. I was so nervous about, about that switching back and forth because in all of the previous workshops I have done over zoom i've never used powerpoint so yay for a tech win um other quick examples of where you can uh access ai tools now uh part of that i mentioned is in google docs so here's an example uh uh, sh sh uh short gif of giving it a prompt of create a, a job post for a sales rep. It says, okay, sure. Give me a second to process. Here you go. And one thing a lot of people have issues with on AI is just different viewpoints of what is helpful to start. Some people look at a blank, a, a blank text doc and say, it's blank. I've got to do everything. This is overwhelming. If I just had something to start with, it'd be a lot better. And then for some people, the, the idea of taking somebody else's work and then adjusting it is like, well, I would rather just do everything on my own. And so not everybody is going to get the same the same benefit from these tools. But th that is is an example in 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 docs. You also have the uh, the example of it being in search. Uh, so I did a search a few days ago uh, for a new phone that has been announced that it exists, but has not given any information about it at all. And it's made by Google that they are having an event October the 4th. I'm a giant nerd. I'm really interested in it. I put that in. And so the... The AI part of this, which again is a labs feature, so you have to opt into, gives you a summary of kind of what information it found about it. Uh, and then every time you see one of these down arrows, you can click that and see where did it pull that information from. And so that is helpful to try to see, okay, where is it pulling this information from? If you if you keep scrolling past that, you see the the normal type of result you would get from Google without the AI part. So it doesn't really replace search; it just adds to it. Okay. Um, other example: cre cre uh, creating images. Um, I am not an artist, uh, but there are a lot of times where I can look at so somebody's art and go. That is incredibly impressive. I'm like, eh, yeah, it took me just, you know, five, 10 minutes, and it would take me 12 hours to have a stick figure. Using AI tools like, like Dolly 
or Stable Diffusion is another one. Um, a third party tool called Dream Studio, I really like as well. Th that is powered by Stable Diffusion, and that made this image here. Now, the text is really small, but I basically gave it a prompt of I want you to make a picture of a horned Hereford bull. Hereford is the breed of cattle that that my family raises. Um, and then gave it some specific information about it should be in a field. There should be trees and mountains in the back and other cows. Is this a perfect image? No, but it's a million times better than what I could do. Okay. Um, some considerations you need to keep in mind when using AI, a big part of it is free versus paid. There are a lot of free tools out there. Some of them are just, hey, it's free, it's open, anybody can use it. Then you have a lot of companies like Bing or Google that are like, hey, we are a for-profit company, we need to make money. So if you ask a question in, and say Bing chat about cars that you may want to buy, it'll be like, yeah, I can give you information. Oh, wait, and th this is an ad here, and this is an ad here. And so you have some... some uh, places where AI is, I, I would say, more developed in search and that they put more time into it because they can make money. So if you're wanting to use uh, search engine AI to shop for things, you're going to get a good experience because they put a lot of work into that because that's how they can make money. Uh, comparatively, you have other tools that may have a free version, but then also have paid option. So chat GPT is free. Chat GPT plus that has access to a newer language model called GPT four that is a lot better quality and gives you um, priority access to to new features. That is twenty dollars a month. Um, personally I don't use any of these AI tools enough in my everyday life to pay for them yet. Uh, and also $20 a month is a lot. Uh, Dream Studio, for example, a lot of the image generation tools give you a certain amount of like credits free, and then you have to pay to get more credits. So that's kind of how a lot of those systems work. Um, other considerations to keep in mind is that these generative tools are creating new content all the time, meaning... Uh, if you took the exact same prompt I showed you a little bit ago and put that into ChatGPT on your own, you would get a different output. I used that same prompt about um, generating five instances of where technology has disrupted education and got a different output every time. And some of those have some similar concepts. Um, the printing press was always the first one, but it's different outputs all the time. Also, a lot of these AI tools have, have a problem with transparency, meaning that they are essentially kind of a black box, meaning that if I went to say, uh, uh, if I went to OpenAI, the company that makes Ch ChatGPT, and said, I will give you a trillion dollars if you can tell me specifically how and why ChatGPT took my prompt and produced this output. The, 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 they are not able to do that. They have the language model, they have the training data, but as far as going in and looking and saying, okay, here's how it went from step to step to step to step, they just don't know. And so because of that, some of the problems with AI that I'm going to talk about next uh, can be a bit difficult to to try to work around for right now. Um, so I do want to talk about the limitations with AI before I talk about the opportunities. The reason is, again, a lot of people uh, view AI as kind of like magic. Uh, I kind of want to dispute that early on so that when we get into some useful examples, it's going to be something that I think it's clear as to how things will work and 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 how they don't work. So uh, an easy an easy example is that for most training data, or for most tools not connected 
to the internet, meaning the tool itself does not have access to the internet, the training data is limited. So chat GPT has data up until about September of 2021. Tools like Bing Chat or Google's generative search experience, uh, they are connected to the internet through those search engines, so they have a better result. I am I am a sports fan. I like the 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 WNBA playoffs are going on right now, so it's a fun time. So in Chat GPT, if I ask it who who won the most recent w WNBA championship, it goes, I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't tell you. If I go to Bing, it's able to use that AI, but also use its search results. And tell me, yeah, sure, the Las Vegas Aces won in 2022. Here's who they beat. The MVP was was Chelsea Gray. That how current the data is is a uh, important part there. Um, uh, another big issue, the biggest one that I have with AI is that these tools are very good at being creative, but not always good at being accurate. Again, these tools have no concept of what is true or correct. They are designed to look at patterns in data and then reproduce those patterns to generate what it thinks you want. Um, what that means is that a lot of times you get what's called a uh, 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 hallucination which is just generating false data and there are a ton of examples of that uh a real uh big one that, that happened over the summer is there was a lawyer in new york that has uh to quote him had heard of chat gpt as a super search engine and so used it to come up with previous legal cases that supported his client in a lawsuit and it created a lot of cases and said yep here are a lot of instances that back up your argument the problem is none of them were actually real it looked at patterns recreated those patterns and gave him the data he wanted so the problem is he didn't fact check any of that then turned that into the court the the opposing lawyers tried to look up these cases and said, we cannot find any of this. And then it eventually came out that he was using chat GPT uh, and there were some problems there for him after the fact. Uh, so hallucinations are a big issue there. One that kind of goes with that is the ability to cite sources. Um, a lot of times with AI tools, they may be able to tell you where they're pulling from or they may not. And if they do, th those sources may exist or they may not. So as an example, I put into ChatGPT, please give me three sources on the history of Vanderbilt University, including including a web address where I can find these sources online. It said, sure, here are three, just real fast. Here's the thing. Uh, source one and three do exist, are correct, are great. Source two does not exist. Now, that could be because it just made it up, or it could also be that that site did exist in 2021, but no longer does. And so that's kind of the problem there. Uh, tools that have a connection to the internet, like Bing, um, are typically a lot better at being able to cite those sources but it's again, it's not perfect. It's better, but not perfect. Um, a big issue also with with all these tools is about privacy. Um, my best advice to you is that if you're using an AI tool and you are not a hundred percent confident that your data is secure, assume that whatever you put in is going to that company and they can use however they want because most of their privacy policies and, and and terms of service usually have something with that. Now, some tools have some options here. So for example, in chat GPT, you can go into settings and go into a section called data controls. 
and you can turn off their ability to use your text to train their model specifically for that. Um, the issue is that that is not available in, in, in all tools. And for us in higher education, we have a lot more privacy to be concerned about. Example, uh, an easy, easy example of that is FERPA. Um, I am not a lawyer. I am, I do not have the ability to tell you what is a FERPA violation or not as a general rule. Um, I would not put any student data, it doesn't matter if it is their name, if it is a paper they wrote, anything like that, into an AI tool, unless you are literally 100% sure that that is completely protected. And I say 100% because I'm like, ah, it's pretty safe. Nope. Because that is a possible issue. Um, so it's better to just not do that and not have that be a concern. Um, another big one is that the data these AI tools use is, is data that comes from people. People are biased and, 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 and obvious and less obvious ways, which means those inherent biases are in the data, which means the tools can therefore uh, have s some biases. Uh, in text-based tools, it could be things like um, how it will look at uh, the usage of he and she in, in a text prompt. In image generation, it's, it's usually a lot more blatant. Uh, example of that is there was a student from MIT that was using an AI tool to make a more professional headshot for LinkedIn. So she used that tool, said, give the girl from the photo a professional LinkedIn profile photo. The AI tool said, okay, what does professional mean to me? I'm going to apply that to her picture. So it, it, it lightened her skin and gave her blue eyes. Uh, as you can tell, these pictures do not match. That is a problem there. And so that comes up a lot in, in image generation. If, if, if you're not careful, there was a, a project published by Bloomberg, I think back in August, where they put in a lot of different job titles and asked for photos. Uh, and so you had examples of like a maid, most of the time showed up as a Hispanic woman. A lawyer was most of the time a white man. So th those things can be a problem. Um, also with that is AI detection tools that we'll talk about in just a minute have been proven to be more biased against non-native English speakers. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why AI detection tools are not um, super great. Again, I'll touch on that in just a minute. Um, another small one that I just kind of throw in because most people don't really think about it is that some AI tools, a lot of them actually, um, they're not great at math because they are language tools, not knowledge tools. So I asked chat GPT, what is 1789 times 2025? I get one answer here. I ask another tool called Claude. I get a different answer here. Which one is correct? Neither, because it's actually uh, this number, which I got from my calculator. Um, now, fun fact, if you take this and put it into Bing, you get the correct answer. Is their AI better? No. Bing is a search engine, and search engines have been able to do math for years. And so it's just a different tool set there. Um, so, okay, all of these issues aside, what is AI actually useful for? A big, easy example is, is what I call flipped assignments. So basically, instead of having, or in addition to having your students write papers, you can give that prompt to AI, have it create text, and then give that text to your students and say, all right, Here's what the AI wrote, grade it. How good is it? 
it are there any issues uh and 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 what it is is stating as fact if it has citations uh are those citations appropriately appropriately used if there are no citations can you find citations for them um how convincing is the is the argument how good is the actual writing what improvements can be made and so this for me does two things number one it shows students how good ai can actually be um especially if they've never used it or they've only used it in limited ways they may not really know number two it helps them be critical of somebody's work. It's kind of like doing a peer review uh, where you don't really have to care about the feelings of the peer because the peer is an AI tool that has no feelings. Example prompt I have here, uh, I put that into several different AI tools um, and, then, uh, and then had it generate text. That is a PDF in the box folder that I'm going to give you a link to in just a few minutes. Um, so you can look over that and see, hey, how useful could this be? One that I like a lot personally is proofreading. Uh, you can use tools like Claude or, or Bard from Google to upload files and say, read over this. And tell me how how can I improve my writing? Um, is this going to be as good a feedback as if your students give you your papers? No, because you're going to be a lot smarter and a lot better at giving feedback than an AI tool. But um, since you can't really uh, give your students that feedback at two in the morning, when their assignment is due in a few hours, AI can. And so it's a useful step there. Uh, you can also use this to say, uh, uh, an example I used uh, is if you have a very large text document. So for example, this is a, a white paper that, that was sent to us this summer. It's like, I do not have time to read 35 pages on this, but I, but if it's useful, I will. So what, so what did I do? I took that, all that text, put it into different AI tools and said, give me a summary of this. And then, and then I was able to say, okay, is this new information? Is it useful? Do I need to look over it? Big key thing here, you're still depending on the AI tool to accurately summarize, to not miss or add things so uh if it's super important you should probably read the, the whole thing if it's not important and you're just trying to save some time great option another one is to create arguments um and one easy example of this uh that i came up with after talking to an instructor after the last workshop is if let's say you have your students doing a presentation on how they can start a business or how they can create some project to improve the environment. They may be so convinced of their point being right and their idea being good that they may not be able to see, okay, what are the questions? What are the downsides of this? And so using AI can, can help come up with those questions. Again, it could be as simple as, Please give me th three three arguments for and against banning the use of generative AI in higher ed, and then it does. Or you could upload your PowerPoint or your paper and say, hey, give me arguments against this. Question what I have in here. And it can do that. Um, another great use is creating images. Uh, again, I am not an artist, but with some real... Uh, quick and easy uh, use of, of either say Bing or, or Dream Studio, you can cr you can have images for presentations. Awesome, great. An issue to be aware of though. Note that uh, for for this use case, the prompt I used asked for uh, uh, an image of a teacher in front of a college classroom. Both appear to be older males wearing a suit. 
I put this prompt into two different tools. Both tools produced four pictures each. All eight pictures had people who appeared to be male. It just at that point kind of assumed, okay, a university professor is probably going to be male. So one of those things you just kind of have to be aware of. Other uses, um, it can be very useful to just come up with ideas and brainstorm. It could be for writings, for activities to do in class, for topics that 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 you should cover. Um, again, I would not take anything that is put out by AI and just say, okay, this is the plan. I'm ready to go. You're going to have to tweak it and edit and do what you can. Uh, another example is to generate code for software or websites. That is a good example of it can definitely generate code. And that's like awesome, cool, great. If you're not a coder, if you are not a programmer, as I am not, uh, I have no idea if what it is putting out is useful or just garbage. I have no idea. So a lot of times with AI tools, if you are not an expert in those fields, you got to be careful with the output it is putting out. Um, another thing, and I'm running out on time, and I apologize for that. I'm going to try to go through some things quickly here. A big thing I encourage you to do is to talk to your students about this. They are in so many different classes and so many different situations that a lot of them genuinely would prefer that you talk to them about it and either explain your viewpoint in your policy or ask them for their opinion. And maybe you can create a policy with them. Um, I do have some sample language from both some people at Vanderbilt and from some other schools across the country that is also in the, in the, in the box folder that I'm just about to give you a link to. Um, a big thing as well, besides talking with students about it, is how do you how do you cut down on the inappropriate use, but still be mindful of um, of of how AI can be useful. And you and you can do some things with assignments to require them to use things you talked about in class to require current events to do personal re reflections. AI is kind of bland on that because it's not a person. Um, and then you can also do things like exploratory activities and do hands-on hands -on activities in class. Uh, I know that doesn't apply to every class, but if you're teaching a course on engineering, and instead of having the paper or instead of having the students write a paper on how to build something, you have them build a scale model of it. AI can't build things yet, yet, but you know. Um, other thing I want to kind of touch on real fast and then I'm going to be done because I know I, I'm at time. And if you, uh, in just to be safe in case you have to drop, I am going to go ahead uh, and put the link for the for the box folder in chat. So if you have to drop, that is totally fine. Uh, you can copy that from chat uh, and put into your browser to get everything I have here. But I do want to talk real quick on AI detection. And the big thing is that right now that just isn't very effective to use tools, whether it be stuff like Turnitin or GPT-0 or all th these other pieces of technology that claim we can spot AI writing. Not really. Um, all of them have a few things in common. Number one, they will admit they cannot be 100% per accurate. And they also never really explain how they are determining if something is AI written. Typically, the best you can get out of them is that they are they are looking for patterns. What those patterns are vary, and whether the, those patterns um, are actually uh, accurate or not, 
we don't really know. Um, also, the big issue that I have is that you are going to have false positives. And so there are several cases, and these are just three examples um, of cases that I found just during the summer of when students have been flagged as being like, this paper was written by AI. I'm going to uh, give you a zero and turn you in to the honor council at different schools across the country. And they were all incorrect. Now, are there students using AI inappropriately? Yes. Are there students taking full text from AI and turning it into assignments? Yes. Is it happening for every student and every assignment? No. And so I think a lot of it is what can, like, if the software doesn't work, how can you tell? Some of that is if you can compare it to to other work. Um, look for inaccuracies in sources, in arguments. In fact, look at the tone of the writing. AI is very, it is very formulaic. It is kind of bland, okay? Um, big thing, though, if you think that text is written by AI, um, to me personally, this is my opinion, clear part there, I would not take that as a as an opportunity to turn that student in because you can't prove it. What I would say is, hey, I want to talk to you about this. Let's talk about your writing. How did you come up with this? What was your thought process? Here are my concerns. Um, some students will just admit, yeah, I was like really behind schedule and I just use AI. Or someone will be like, nope, that's just how I write. Um, and also some of them will say, oh, I sound like AI. That's an insult. Okay, I need to improve my writing. And that's good. Okay. Um, last thing I'm going to end on, and I apologize for being a few minutes over, uh, other resources um, that can be useful to you. Uh, we at the CFT um, just uh, just updated our teaching guide on uh, on on teaching in the age of AI that we put out. We updated it last or two weeks ago, I think. Um, that is also, I have a link in the box folder. Uh, if I can get to my uh, Chrome tab, I will get that copied for you as well. Um, and all of the other links on this slide, because in addition to, in addition to that teaching guide, the, 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 Data Science Institute here at Vanderbilt has been in a lot of workshops on AI. Uh, I may be biased, but I think that they are very, very good and awesome. And if you can attend them in person, great. Here are the topics that they are doing in the fall. If you cannot attend them in person, that's okay, because they record all of them and put them on YouTube. So uh, I also included a link to the, to their YouTube channel. You can go back and watch a lot of them. They're really excellent. Uh, and then, and then I also have a link to our uh, to our Brightspace workshops. Uh, we're going to be doing more on AI. I don't have anything set and planned yet, but this is a thing that's not going to go away. The university is very is very focused on on doing as much as we can to support uh the Vanderbilt community in figuring out how to use AI if they want to, if they don't want to, that's fine. And 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 how to make the most of that. Okay. So that is my end. I apologize for being a little bit over time, but I do also want to uh have it open for any questions or any comments or anything like that. Uh, again, I am not a computer science expert, but I will do what I can if anybody has questions. If not, I appreciate you being here and hope you have a lovely rest of your day. But if anybody has questions, unmute, hop in, be glad to answer whatever I can.
I've got to run, but I just wanted to say thank you for a great session. Uh, I feel a lot more prepared to talk with folks who are um, variously cool. panicking or uh, elated. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have a good yeah. one. All right. Bye.